So we hope you enjoyed that. Um, we are joined now with Nan Zhang and Thomas Chen from Source Group. And we are super, super lucky to have them um, because in my opinion, they are, and not only my opinion, but uh, verifiably, they are some of the top experts on Google Cloud Platform security anywhere in the world. And I am lucky enough to work with them day to day. So um, welcome, Nan and Thomas. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. you. Yeah, glad to have you here. So maybe uh, if you want to talk through um, just a quick uh, intro about yourselves. Um, I know that, uh, so I work with you day to day um, uh, with the bank that I work for. Um, and uh, yeah, so how did you guys get into this GCP security game? Yep. Uh, so for sure, we actually do have a introduction, but I guess we'll just skip that. Sure. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I was probably one of the earliest uh, consultant that worked with their GCP platform, especially in banking industry a few years ago. Uh, we built a couple of platforms for one of the large banks here in Canada, as well as one uh, in Australia. And then just got to know the Google team, the platform, fell in love with it. Um, and um, yeah, so basically was able to just get get into the game early enough, I think. <laughs> yeah, and then I just saw, saw the, how the platform has grown in the past uh, three or four years in my in front of my eyes. It was really good, great, great to see. Like additional features were added every other week that was useful for automation deployments for GKE for security. And yeah, it's been get, getting to a really complete platform by now. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with you. And things are starting. You can definitely see that maturation over the last little while. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Thomas, um, how would you get into things? Yeah, my uh, name's Thomas. I'm consultant with Source Group as well. Uh, I spent most of my career in, in a lot of heavily regulated industries like insurance and healthcare and financial institutions. I started my career uh, doing a lot of full stack dev and engineering. And uh, when cloud came, I, I got all gung ho about cloud architecture. So I got into that as well. And uh, just kind of naturally moved towards um, um, DevOps because yeah, I've been in that space where uh, we did a lot of manual deployments and the headaches that came in. So when cloud came and all this uh, automation came along, I was like, it just naturally fit for me. And uh, just sort of built a passion for engineering and all things cloud native. So. Here we are. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we're, we're super happy to have you, and I'll let you guys go for, uh, go ahead with the, your presentation. I'm really excited to see your demo. Um, and so, yeah, everyone should be looking forward to that. Um, and, yeah, so I'll let you guys run. Yeah, thanks so much, Greg. Thanks Thank you. Also, yep. So, yes, good afternoon, um, everyone. So hope, hopefully you guys are having a great Saturday, staying safe and happy. Uh, so today we'll just be talking about a few methodologies that we are used, we're using with our clients on how to deal with the ever-changing landscape of uh, public cloud security. Like I was just mentioning, uh, public cloud is changing really, really fast. It changed, um, on average, there are nine pushes to a platform, either a GCP, AWS, or Azure a day. And then it's really hard to stay on top of your game if you don't know, if you have, don't have the proper principles and controls. Um, so today we'll probably be starting talking about those. So just as a brief introduction, as you already heard, uh, my name's Nan. Um, Tommy, if you want to go next. Um, my name is Nan. I've been working with Source for about four years. And uh, for today, we'll be going over security and cloud principles that we think are rather important, some samples. Um, we're going to be talking about preventative control, a detective control, which are two control methodologies that we use in our day-to-day -day lives as well as a quick demo on Forsythia Validator. And Tom, yeah, so the company was founded in 2010 uh, in Sydney, Australia. So it was a group of small group of people that then naturally expanded to Canada because there was any, uh, some Canadian connection. So we now have three regions within the world, uh, one here in Toronto, which is our headquarters. So that's where me and Tom are located. Um, and then we, we have another office in Sydney, Melbourne, Singapore, Malaysia. So we are focused on security uh, as well as automation and transfer, cloud transformation for large financial institutes. Um, we have a vertical in public sector in uh, aviation, which has been hit hard this year, uh, as well as media and healthcare. Uh, we are, I believe, the only headquartered consulting shop in, in the world that in, in Canada that has the three top tier um, um, partnership with the hyper cloud providers. So AWS, Azure, and GCP. 
we're all of a top tier partner. And we do have a, a bunch of specializations as well. Uh, so for today, I'll be starting with uh, security and cloud principles. Top next. So uh, why do we actually have to talk about uh, cloud principles when we talk about security? Well, uh, if you think about it, right, security opinions have to be derived from somewhere. Your security team won't just come and say, you know what, I think you should do this. They need to provide concrete evidence as well as on how to, on, guide, on, on guidances to help uh, the platform to become more secure. Did you go next? And I do want to apologize. We thought we we're going to present, uh, each of us was going to present, but turns out we can only have one present uh, presenters. That's why Tom is presenting. I have to tell him uh, to go next. So uh, the security opinion, uh, the cloud principles themselves enable organization to be successful, right? This includes um, building platform application agility through automation standardization. Those are one of the main principles that we follow. Another is to not risk the cloud provider. So basically leverage all the features, all the night pushes a day from cloud providers themselves at the exp same exponential pace that we do um, as part of the platform. As well as uh, collaborating with your risk team, your compliance team, your infrastructure team and developer team to gap the silo that we, we've all known and seen in our day to days to bring them all together. Just to give you some sample principles, uh, next. Uh, so just um, when you talk about, for example, data, right? So cloud principles in data would include um, something like all data stored in cloud should be uh, encrypted at rest. When you transfer the data over, it should be encrypted in transit. You should always have a multi-layer security control around your data to prevent any, any data exfiltration. For a cloud principle around IAM, it's um, the one that we are all known for. Um, so basically you have to follow principle of least privileged and then no user should have day-to-day -day access to your non-prod and prod environment. From your, your deployment side of things that so we believe a cloud principle for deployment would be that you should always be doing Git-driven deployments and no manual access to console. This may be a, a change for some of you, but we believe it actually really helps guide your security operation opinions. And I'll be explaining that, uh, explaining that in a bit. We also do think that all deployments to non-production and production should be peer reviewed via your GitOps approach. So if you're trying to change a production level uh, system, it should be reviewed as part of a code review. It should be reviewed as part of a change ticket and only gets pushed to production when your peers thinks there's no problem with it. And there should always be an adequate level of testing as well. So based on these principles, we then move on to controls. Next time. So yeah, so we talk about controls and there are usually two types of controls that we're really uh, used to. One is called preventative control and the other, the other is called detective control. Just to give you a real life example that's actually happening right now because I can hear it. Like it's me telling my daughter that you're not gonna watch more YouTube, right? I'm gonna go into the router, find your MAC address and just kill that. It, it acts, has happened before. Right, that's a preventative control. So when she opens her Mac uh, uh, tablet, she wouldn't be able to access YouTube, uh, which she's doing right now because I'm doing this presentation. <laughs> uh, another way of a control, detective control, is me and my wife are both working. It's 6 p.m. and she's uh, my daughter's home downstairs, and my wife went to get some water and she's like, "Oh, you know what? She's watching YouTube because she finally figured out how to press the YouTube button on your TV," and then she somehow got into Paw Patrol. Right, so that's me, my wife telling me that she's detected something that's go that's going on in my household and I have to do something about it. So yeah, so I'll be going through the preventative control side of things uh, where Tom will be talking about uh, detective control. Uh, so preventative control, uh, if you just go next slide, has to start with a strong, what I call a, a foundation pyramid, right? you have to be able to enforce certain things. For example, you're not gonna have manual access to your non prod and prod environments. On top of that, all your deployments are happening with infrastructure as code and GitOps pipeline. And on top of that is where most of my content is gonna be around consumables. So what is a consumable? Consumable is actually a piece of infrastructure as code package. It can be in Terraform, 
It can be in Azure ARM, it can be in Deployment Manager or CloudFormation, or anything you want. You can write your own APIs. But this is a collective opinion that packaged, uh, that's get packaged together and gets consumed by other people. As an example of a GCS bucket, your, your application team is going to come and say, you know what, we have an opinion on, around GCS. We want our GCS buckets to be regional redundant. So if a flood happens in US East, I, my bucket is still alive because my data is in US West as well. Or security will come and say, you know what, no bucket should be publicly, publicly accessible. Yeah, pretty straightforward. Where infrastructure opinion will come and say, you know what, all GCS buckets should have version enabled. It helps us manage and roll back if there's something wrong. And you can have more opinions around this, where your compliance could come and say, you know what, all data access logs should be enabled by default, where your networking team will be like, oh, you know what, we need to be drawing out networking parameters to protect our GCS bucket. So you merge all these opinions together and it forms a GCS consumable. This also really helps, um, this helps really bring the teams together as well when you think about it, right? There's maybe 25 to 30 common resources that your application team is gonna consume in cloud, maybe even less. And when you talk about each of them with all the teams around, your security team, your infrastructure team, and your application team, right? You can bring their opinions together. Everyone gets a better understanding of how they're consuming cloud in general. This also helps misconfiguration of tools. So if you go to the next slide, and basically a screenshot I took a couple of days ago, these are all, not all actually, maybe 80%, maybe 90% of the options that you're using to create a GK cluster in the GCP console. There are about 45 different um, options here, right? So, so for, for any individual to come and see, you know what, I want to create a GK cluster. Here are the 45 different things that I may want to think about. It's going to be a very taunting task. Your security team may also have an opinion around like, oh, you know what, we should always be uh, in, you know, enabling workload identity. We should always include, in, enable private cluster where your networking team will be like, you know what, I need to protect my GKE master. So no outside resources can hit it. And if there's a bug, I may be getting hacked. Your developer team may have an opinion. I want Istio or I want TPUs because I'm doing Kubeflow, but they may not have the opinions around security, right? And your DevOps team may have opinions around automation. So you, you know, we, we want to hook up uh, maintenance windows as well as um, build pipelines to our GKE clusters automatically. So if you have someone configure this yourself, you're gonna misconfigure 90% of the time because either they don't have the knowledge or they just don't want to know, right? Where if you think about getting all these opinions packaged together and just send it as a, a module, a Terraform module, a deployment manager module and say, you know what? Here are the three things we allow you to change. You can change the cluster name, size, and if you want a Istio or TPU, right? Your developer will be able to say, you know what? That's simple enough. I can say, I can configure these four things why all the security opinions, operation opinions, networking opinions are all taken care of. So, and we do recommend when you do this kind of uh, consumables, you start from day zero. So um, this, when you build this whole thing, right, if you go to the next time, you are preventing any configuration drift in day zero. You don't want to just give people access to be able to go click on things, and 11, day, uh, 11 months later, you, you're like, oh, we've left with 45 GK clusters. That's all configured differently. But if you push those consumables concept out in day zero, you're gonna be able to get people to understand it, use it, give you opinions, bring the teams together. And you know what? Getting the standard one is actually the simplest for them. So we do recommend the consumables model since day zero. If you go next, um, also, GK is just an example, GCS is, is an example. You can then potentially build a library of all consumables, right? Which I call primitive consumables. You have opinions around your virtual machines, your GKE clusters, your Redis, your Cloud SQL databases, your storage buckets. These are primitives. These primitives can be distributed to teams when they have a specific need. When they spin up some resources, they will just get opinions of these primitives themselves. And when they are used to the model, they can even start building patterns themselves 
that can be feed back into the platform team. So for example, if a team is always going to be using a GK cluster with the Cloud SQL backend, and then they have a Redis for caching purposes for the session cache, and have a GK uh, for uh, have a global load balancer and Cloud Armor in front, and you're seeing this as a pattern with your organization, you can just package these infrastructures code together as what I call an application consumable. So at that point, you have an application consumable you can just dis distribute to other teams saying, you, want, you know what, this is a standard architecture within our environment. If you're consuming GKE, we recommend a Redis for your session data. We recommend Cloud SQL. And here are the eight op options that you can configure in order for you to get the full stack infrastructure up and running. The more you build, the less other people have to worry about. You became a fast paced moving organization with many standard um, stand, standard pieces of uh, infrastructure that can be reused across different teams. So what are preventative controls good for? Um, thinking about day zero, right? When you start your cloud journey, um, your preventative control would probably be good for any core infrastructure. So if you're creating a project, you're doing IEMs, you're doing your account service principles, uh, or service accounts, you're doing your VPCs, um, you're doing your DNS or organization policies. What we recommend is that these will always stick to preventative control because you this gets barely touched, right? It's, it's a low effort to maintain, but you get a lot of value in audit as well as review capabilities. When you move on to application infrastructure, it's still re recommended to start with preventative control because as I said, it helps with misconfigurations. It gets to an understanding for developers to know exactly what they're consuming. And then they don't have to worry about many of other components that they, they may not be knowledgeable for. So yeah, so we do believe that you should always retain a preventative control framework for your core infrastructure and while potentially moving your application infrastructure to a different control later on. Let's go next. Let's just go next. So yeah, uh, the one um, outside of the preventative control, that's also baseline, it's IEM, right? IEM is actually what prevents people from doing things that you don't want them to do. So it doesn't matter if you're using AWS, Google, or Azure. IEM is your crown jewel of a platform. You should always be controlling who can do what where. That way you can have effective controls for your platform build out. And uh, at this point, I'll be handing this to Tom for um, for explanation of uh, detector controls. Thanks, man. That was informative. So detector controls, what are detective controls? So up until now, we've been talking about preventive controls, which I like to call uh, freedom without guardrails. Um, detective controls on the other hand is, is freedom without the guardrails, but parent with parental supervision, so to speak. Its duty is not to obstruct, its duty is to inform and correct where it can. Um, so it's not supposed to stop you from doing what you should be doing. But if, if you do do those things, it will find out about them, it will tell you about them and apply correct, corrective action where necessary. So anybody who's uh, familiar with Liam Neeson's works, um, sort of like what he does. <laughs> um, so, We've talked about preventing resources from being deployed based on a set of security policies in place. What about resources that are already deployed and live? What if security policies change? Or even what if an administrator applies a firewall change that they shouldn't be doing accidentally? These are all examples of where detective controls um, are necessary to complement your security controls. The more peripheral reason that not a lot of security teams uh, are, are thinking about is um, about upskilling your organization, right? So preventive controls with guardrails can be sometimes quite restricting, right? You're not only stopping your team from doing things, but at times you might be stopping them from learning. So the last thing you want to do is slow down your teams. That's kind of where uh, preventive controls in an organization as they mature in, the, in their cloud journey should give rise to more detective controls over time. So over here, we have a graph of kind of uh, the natural progression of of some of the more success, most successful organizations when they start their cloud journey. Initially, they want to have preventive controls in place 
just to kind of guide them and in, in, in set them straight before moving to more detective controlled based measure as they mature in the cloud. Right. So um, preventive controls are a powerful set of security tools and it's important that we uh, implement preventive measures early on in an org's cloud journey to shape their cloud foundation and lock down suspect behavior. And Nance touched on uh, about this earlier. Uh, but you know, we've all been at organizations where too much restriction may start to impede productivity, innovation, and the rate at which your cloud team upskills. So we start to turn into that overbearing parent. So it's, an, it's important as the organization matures that we start to kind of peel back this bubble wrap off as, as teams want to start to accelerate and move faster. So how do we do that? We can start to loosen restrictions on preventative controls and resources and allow teams to be autonomous and replace these preventative controls with more detective-based measures. But uh, the question becomes, and what do we loosen these restrictions on? How do we choose which resources? So that's what, what we call the line, right? And Nan has talk, touched upon this earlier. Uh, there's a set of core infrastructure that you kind of always want to have preventive controls in place. These are resources that, you know, your application teams don't really interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, they might maybe make some requests now and then to gain some more access, that sort of thing. But things like your project structure, shared BPCs, your, your network design, um, service accounts, things like that, they're not really interacted with uh, from your application team on a day-to-day. -day. So we kind of want to have that preventive control measure in place always for your core infrastructure. Then there's your application infrastructure that your application teams do uh, interact with every day. And, you know, instead of having us tell them what they can and can't do, uh, we kind of, as they mature, as the organization matures, you kind of want to let them experiment, let them um, start using these and, and start learning, right? So that's kind of where we want to loosen some of these preventative measures in some of these consumables that we've mentioned earlier. Now, when I say um, loosen, we're not saying get rid of the, the controls. We're merely saying they should come in a form of more detective-based measure where you're not stopping them from making these mistakes, but then you can detect it and you can remediate it. And that's what detective controls are. So over here is a sort of an overview of some of the uh, detective control solutions available that you can leverage in public cloud today. This isn't by any means an, an exhaustive list of, of uh, solutions available today. I mean, AWS has quite a bit of names that I can't even remember, but um, they, we are focusing on this in this uh, talk about more customizable policy-based threat detection. So specifically uh, for SETI uh, in GCP. So what is, uh, geez, what is Forseti? Forseti is just, a, it's an individual uh, three-tier app that you can spin up in any project. It just works like a three-tier app with a client server and a, and a SQL database. It scans your resources based on a snapshot of your asset inventory, which you can generate in any, um, in any project. Oh, my Siri just went off. Um, and based on those, those resources that it scans, it can, it can notify and alert and remediate any violations that your resource states are, are in violation of. So what does that look like from an architecture perspective? Well, for SETI actually contains about five main parts. There is the inventory, which essentially is what I mentioned before. It's just an, a snapshot of your assets within your project, and it's just an, an comes in a form as a JSON file. It's a JSON dump of, of uh, all of your resources in your project, along with a lot of the metadata with it. It stores this as a snapshot in your backend SQL database. Now in this particular architecture, we're using Cloud SQL, but it doesn't have to be Cloud SQL. It can be any sort of SQL relational database that you choose. Um, it consists of a scanner, which scans uh, your your asset inventory against policies that you've defined and will alert you of any violations using the notifier plugin. That notifier plugin is essentially just uh, another component which allows you to uh, send notifications to any to a number of different third party applications like Slack or to a GCS bucket or to security, security command center 
which essentially is another GCP product that allows you to aggregate a lot of your security findings. And of course, emails as well. It's, there's an explainer uh, component, which essentially is just information on the violations that come back from your scanner and explains what those are. And of course, your enforcer component, which should you choose to configure it that way, will remediate any findings by um, setting things that are different from your, your, your desired state and sets them back to your, your desired state, your things are in conflict. So up until now, we've been talking about preventative and detective controls as two separate concepts in your toolbox to manage security. In the previous example, uh, suppose I wanted to uh, set up a network, uh, network APC and not allow SSH out to the internet. Um, now, I could either set it, I, sounds like I need to set up, set it up at both your detective control framework and your preventative control framework. Sounds like I need to do it twice, which sounds like a lot of uh, overhead. Um, do I need to do that? And the answer is no. We can actually use what's called config validators, which is part of your Forsetti toolbox to combine both preventative and detective controls in one place. Sort of a one tool that does both. So how does this work? We need not define policies twice. Uh, we can define Forseti uh, constraints, what Forseti calls constraints, uh, which are just a, a YAML configuration file that if a lot of people, a lot of you who use Kubernetes and Open Policy Agent would be familiar with the format of this. And they can be defined once in a central, centrally located organization repo. And Forseti comes with a config validator and Terraform comes with a Terraform validator, which both consume this centrally uh, located uh, policy defined in, in uh, Rego and essentially validate uh, the same outcomes. So from what does this look like from an operations workflow perspective? We have a security admin that can pull down constraint templates from a Forseti security library and this Forseti security library is an open source repo contributed by the community that you can take down and store in your own uh, central repo in a, either a, an artifactory or your own repos, internal repos, and customize to your own security posture. They can modify these templates as needed. And basically that is managed by, that, can, that might be managed by your security architects. Then you have your Terraform validator, which traditionally would be your DevOps teams that control your CI CD pipelines and are in charge of deploying things like your, your GCP resources. And this Terraform validator will consume and pull the policies from your centrally managed repo and validate your Terraform plans before actually deploying them to your GCP environment. And of course, your SecOps teams in charge of ongoing policy enforcement will get notifications and direction to remediate potential security threats in any live running environments should the state of resources de deviate from your desired state. And they're just reading from the exact same centrally um, defined repo. So quick demo. As I mentioned before, uh, the, the config validator is actually consists of three parts. There's your policy library, and this is again where your security architects would check out um, check out from and actually manage their own their own sort of customized repo. This is where they would be defining their own policies and constraints. You have your config validator for Frasetti, which will consume those same policies as well as your Terraform validator, which also consume those policies as well. So this, what this looks like is then, I have a simple deployment here of a Terraform template that just deploys a simple compute instance in GCP. And of course an access config that uh, deploys, uh, that gives an external IP. 
for, and then I have my policy library. This is where your policies reside, which contain your constraints and your templates. And I'll go over in a sec what that is. And I can show you in real time how this actually works. So the first thing I would do if I want to, de to deploy this, first create a Terraform plan. And it's created my plan here, over here. Now the Terraform validator actually works by uh, validating against the JSON version of your Terraform plan. So I would be creating a Terraform JSON format of the Terraform plan over here. And I've downloaded my Terraform validator here, which is just the compiled binary of the Terraform validator. Terraform validator is written in Go. So essentially you can compile it and modify it as you please. And uh, just, it just runs off of a Go binary. So I can run that. So what's happening now is that it's actually going into my policy library, which I've defined as a path and as an environment, environment variable. So if I look at my policies, there's constraints and templates. So what are constraints and templates? Templates are, sent, are, are, are uh, essentially just the predefined templates that, uh, or packages that uh, the community has already written to um, in Rego, and they're essentially policies to, to validate certain GCP resources. So people who are, who are used to Kubernetes will find this very familiar. And in line of it is actually the actual Rego code that defines the actual policy to validate it against. So in my, and then there's constraints, which essentially are the actual constraints that your validator will validate it against and will actually use these templates and supply the necessary properties to validate it against. So for example, um, there's an external IP access one for compute. It takes in parameters such as mode and instances, and you can configure it to work either, either as a blacklist or a whitelist, and we'll validate accordingly. So I don't have any constraints defined at the moment. So while this is running, it should come back with no violations. So essentially, anything you put in this constraints folder are the actual live constraints that it's going to be validating against. So, yep. No violations found. So now I've got a pre-written constraint here. If I just put it back into the folder. And essentially all I'm saying is let's use the template that doesn't allow any external IPs. And I've given it a whitelist, an empty whitelist. So if I run this validator again, it's going to again go through my policies and templates, read them all in, find the actual constraints, and validate accordingly. Now, I'm showing you what's under the hood. Ideally, what you want is um, this to be running in an actual pipeline, your a Terraform pipeline. So in the previous example, uh, when it finds no violations, that's when you would um, pass the build and actually do the deployment. In this case, I've added a policy where I'm not allowing external IPs. So if it fails, finds any violations, that's when you would fail the build and stop the deployment. So this would show you sort of your preventative control side of things. Similarly, there's the Forseti side. Now I don't have, time's not allowed to actually show, me, show you the whole Forseti side of things, but it works in a similar fashion where it's validating your asset inventory. And I do have an example of what your asset inventory sort of looks like. And it's sort of a JSON dump of all of your resources in your GCP project. And along with all the metadata that goes along with it. So when you download your Forseti config validator, it essentially allows it to validate uh, your Forseti resources against Rego code in your policy library. So again, so here we've, it's finished um, validating my template. It's found the constraint. 
at this point, this is where you would fail your pipeline. And that's sort of how you can see how one policy defined in one centrally located area can control both your, your deployment pipelines as well as your detective controls in Forseti. So continuing on, if you want to learn more about how, how this, some of these policies and kind of play around with policies, I do have some links here. Uh, feel free to screenshot it um, uh, and yeah, take it away. Yep, and um, so um, we've also, so our company has also just spun up a, a different uh, entity called Kivera that will be doing a multi-cloud uh, preventative controls for you. So if you were interested, take a look at Kivera.io. It's not in a product phase yet, it's just in under testing, but uh, it's quite interesting. I've seen a couple of demos. Uh, if you ever do want to just learn about how our journey of GCP is, there is a white paper for your top right. Um, go take a look at that. And also any security assessment that you will potentially need help with, just like how Greg is uh, doing with us uh, beginning of the year, be coming to us uh, via that link as well. And lastly, um, follow us on our LinkedIn. Um, if you are looking for uh, opportunities or you wanna just chat with us, connect with us, we're just a bunch of techies located in Canada, Australia, Singapore. Uh, we speak a lot of different languages as well. So just connect with us and any questions will be open to tech now. Thank you. Greg, you're muted if you're talking. I was muted and I am talking. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate you taking the time to walk through that. That was a bunch of knowledge bombs uh, all over the place. Um, we did have a couple of questions. I think we could probably take uh, one or two minutes of questions. Um, and so one of the questions was, so for certain you can automatically generate an IoT asset list and apply policies accordingly? It depends on the IoT access. Um, so if our IoT access has been configured as a GCP resource, yes. Because um, for SETI takes the entire GCP environment, your everything within your GCP, and then you can write your own policies as well in Regal. If you've ever done any open policy agents, OPA, Gatekeeper uh, with um, CNCF, the policies are the exact same syntax. You just have to write it yourself. Yeah, I, okay. I wouldn't be surprised if there's also open source capabilities already around. Yeah, and if it generates resources and it generates metadata. You could write Regal to actually validate against it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And uh, I mean, it's nice to have that sort of asset list that you can then, um, you know, just right up front that just makes it a lot easier to then start considering what you could use it for once you can see all the assets that are in the environment. Um, you know, uh, let's just say, I mean, most people that I know of haven't got into using for a SETI. How would someone start uh, that sort of process? What do you, what do you, would you recommend? Yeah, so for SETI, like Thomas said, it's just a 2x2 slash 3 tier application. Uh, it's super simple to set up. You just have to create a project within your GCP. There is a Terraform module for, for SETI. Uh, go to their website, for forsetisecurity.com, and you'll be able to just find instruction on running the Terraform module, which will set up all the components with you. But in mind that you do need to give permissions to yourself in order to bring those resources up, as yeah. always. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, it's super powerful. So you want to make sure that you're careful with the permissions that you granted as you as you work through things. Um, so yeah, that's great. Um, there are a couple other questions in, in on the YouTube live stream, but we'll have to sort of answer those in stream. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, guys, for joining us today and um, and spending some time with the community. Um, and thank you for talking uh, about the important concepts here. It's been fantastic working with you guys the last six months and. I've personally learned a ton um, just from the conversations that we've had. So thanks so much again for sort of condensing it all down into one sort of tight conversation. This is like, honestly, six months worth of learning sort of in an hour. <laughs> That's what yeah. I know about it anyway. Yeah, basically <laughs> everything that we've been talking about for months and months and months, it's all right here. So it's uh, fantastic. Thanks for doing that. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to be here. Thanks Anytime. for the opportunity. And we'll get you back for, for DevFest next year too.